In episode 49, I discussed teleconverters, back button focus, and where in Africa the best place is to see wildlife. Episode 49 starts now. Hi everybody, my name is Jerry, I'm from Wild Eye, and this is episode number 49 of the Wildlife Photography Q&A series in which I answer your wildlife photography related questions. Um, it's T minus like four days till my safari season kicks off big time. On Saturday, I'm off to Monopools for a week, South Luangwa to for a week. Um, from there, straight into Kenya for the Big Cats and Tuskers Safari, uh, which is I think about nine days. After that, home for five days, back up to Kenya for Great Migration Safaris, back to South Africa for a week, up to Norway for Svalbard to photograph polar bears, back to South Africa for a couple of weeks, and then back to South Luangwa. So. Some amazingly exciting stuff coming up. Got some good people I'm traveling with. Can't wait for the season. It's going to be amazing. Uh, number 49. Yeah, I, I wanted to kind of get to this one sooner, but the amount, the, the kind of the business took off, travel's going all over the place. So finally we're there, number 49. Now, before we get into today's questions, at number 50, I'm going to stop this. So then the Q&As are finished for now. Um, I was thinking if you have any questions that you still would like me to answer in episode 50, fire them through any of my channels. The details are at the end of this video. Otherwise, I'm working on kind of looking at the questions that got asked most often. Uh, things like how to get into wildlife photography. I'm not going to look at the kind of the, the gear question as to what is the best camera because that's well, how long is a piece of string. There really is no answer for that. So at this stage, I'm looking kind of a best of, look at the most common questions and see how we can add value from that point of view. But if you still have any questions left, fire through, leave a comment, get in touch, and I'll try and include that for you as well. Hoping to get that one out on Thursday or Friday this week before I leave um, to give you guys something to look at while I'm away. Right, I'm going to get right into it. Number 49 starts now. Tiggs asked on Instagram, maybe not a technical photography question, However, I struggle to contain my excitement when seeing the animals. How do you stay composed to get the best shot? Tig, you know why I love this question is it means you're doing it for the right reason. It means you're going out into the field for the right reason. You're excited to see the animals. You, you, you have that nervous jitters when you see your first leopard up a tree, whatever it might be. Now, a couple of things. I mean, normally on our great migration safaris, when we see our first river crossing, I'll tell people often, and you can see they've got that jitter, is, you know, put your camera down and just watch it first. Just experience the sight. If you look at it first for a while, your photographic brain will kick in and you will see new things to photograph, new ways to photograph it. And also by looking at something first without the camera, you, you can start appreciating what it is about that subject or scene that attracts your eye. And then that's what you go after photographically. When I went up to Svalbard for the first time about four years ago, the, the, I, th I think it was one of the, skip, the skipper of the ship maybe, um, we were discussing seeing your first polar because that was like a mind job for me. That was like, holy shit, this is incredible. And he told someone else, and I overheard this, and he said, just think of it as a big sheep and then photograph it. So if that works for you, go for it. But like I said, I would, especially if you're going on a four, five, 10 day safari, don't worry about getting the shots first. For me, and I've said this many, many times before, wildlife photography is not, end goal is not to just get the images. It should be the entire experience of wildlife photography. Being out there, seeing the animals, smelling them, hearing them, all of that. That's the experience. And once you've got that, decide what it is that you want to photograph and that's what you go after. I think it'll answer both things. It'll make you be more composed when you decide to go for the images and in the end, I think you're going to get better shots. But it's a good thing. I think that nervousness and the excitement when you see animals, I think it's a great thing. Lucas asked on Instagram, I know the lens size versus shutter speed rule. I have a 200 mil, so I have to set my shutter to at least one over 200th of a second. What if I use a two times converter? Do I have to set my speed to one over 400th of a second? Lucas, theoretically, yes. Um, for those of you that just kind of get on the same page here, if you're shooting a 200 millimeter lens, your, your shutter speed should theoretically be one over 200. If you shoot a 400, it should be one over 400. It's kind of a rough guideline just to, just to kind of ensure that you get, don't get camera shake from hand holding that camera. So 
I mean, the one over 200 for a 200 mil lens is correct, but we're not taking into account things like good camera technique where you don't move around much. We're not taking into account new technology, which is vibration reduction or image stability, whatever you want to call it. So theoretically, yes, if you're putting a converter on and you're converting a 200 mil into a 400 mil, yes, you can use one over 400 as your new shutter speed guideline. But again, if you, depending on what lens this is, if you're using a prime and it's got vibration reduction built in, image stability, then you can get away with one over 200, one over 125, whatever the case is. Again, I mentioned this a couple of episodes ago. Um, I've shot a 600 mil handheld at one over 10 seconds and it worked. It worked. I braced, held very still. My subject was standing still as well and I fired off a few frames and I got the shot. So remember, Lucas, it's just a guideline. But if you want to stick and follow through on that guideline, yes, add the converter and that new focal length should be your shutter speed. I've been I've asked on Instagram, what are the pros and cons of back button focusing versus shutter button, especially for action, movement and composition? I mean, I can give you the pros. I'm not sure there are many cons. Um, from a, what do you mention, composition and action point of view. So composing, if I'm focusing on my back button, I will hold the back button in, compose, release. I can move around if the subject is not moving and then fire. So composition works much better. Um, for a moving subject, I find it easy and it makes sense in my mind that if that subject's moving, I can lock onto him using my back button, hold my thumb in and then pick my shots as I go. It just makes sense to me. Um, I know it doesn't. I don't know. That, I know it doesn't work this way. But in my mind, to think that if I'm going to use the front shutter button to focus as well, if I'm relying on that button to do metering and focusing and shooting, I know it doesn't work like this. In my mind, it makes sense. Um, I would rather disconnect back button focus and put well focus and put it on the back button. Use that to focus. The composition works so much easier, um, and then just fire on the front. I can also very easily, let's say you want to expose on the front button and focus on the back. You can hit the focus, yeah, release, recompose, choose the exposure, recompose again. I can focus again, release, expose again, release, and at the end fire. There, there really is no other option for me in wildlife than to go to back button focus. In the description of this video down on YouTube and in Facebook, I'll add the three links. Well, I'll add you the main one where Andrew did a beautiful blog on back button focus. If you have, if you want to improve your photography, I would go this far. Go to back button focus for wildlife. There really, really is no other option. Tony asked on Instagram, I'm traveling to Africa in early July and I have a Nikon D5000. Is there a go-to setting that I could use for most shots, dawn and dusk? As things happen quite fast, I should imagine. I could put on an auto, but that's not the best, is it? Thanks, Tony. Um, you could put it into auto, but then you're handing over pretty much everything. The technical decisions, the creative input, everything you're giving to the camera and say, you know what, you decide what this image should look like. Not great. Now, the D5000 is a great camera. It has a lot of versatility, and I'm sure it'll do you well. The, the problem I have, and I've said this again in the past, with go-to settings or recipe-driven settings is nothing is ever the same. I can say to you, if you're going to see a leopard in a tree um, with the sun behind it at 5 o'clock, then you have to go to this setting. Or I can say to you, if you're going to see a beautiful male lion walking at you with the sun coming from behind you, and it's about 2 in the afternoon, you have to go to that. It doesn't work. Because depending on how far you zoom in, what you decide to include in the frame will determine what you have to shoot. Now, I know where you're going because dusk and dawn is the difficult time to shoot. That's when the light drops. So instead of looking for recipes or the go-to settings, yeah, I would encourage you and urge you and recommend very strongly that you have a look at the basics of shutter speed, ISO and aperture. Because if you understand that, you can go to any setting at any given point in time. When the light drops, here's one. I think the most important thing is ISO. You need to understand that the sun's down in the morning, yeah? That means your ISO is up. As the sun comes up and goes higher in the sky, your ISO comes down. When the sun stays up midday, your ISO is down here. As the sun starts dropping, your ISO goes back up again. I'm shooting and I'm talking for aperture mode specifically now. Um, and then if you look back to the previous, whose question was it? I think it was Lucas's question on shutter speed. If you understand the ISO relationship and how that helps your shutter speed to stay up, 
then you should be good to go. That's your go-to settings. So again, I know it, fe it feels like work and a lot of people, they wanna hack it and do the shortcut. What is my go-to setting? What's my recipe? Recipes will not work in photography. It's not gonna work. So go and understand and go into the Wild Eye blog. We've done things on this. The shutter speed focal length relationship, um, the back button focus thing, why ISO is important. All of those things are on there. Take some time, do the homework. You'll be so glad that you did when you get into the field because then you wouldn't have to worry about, oh shit, the, so, so the, the rhino's walking diagonal across, but the sun's coming from this side. What is my gut? No, you don't have to worry about which setting to go to. You can just worry about dialing in the correct setting for the image that you want to create and it'll work from there. So again, don't, don't, I hear everybody wants the shortcut and the hack. Don't go there. Forget the go-to settings, forget the recipe settings. Go and do a little bit of work. Take one afternoon, take a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, whatever works for you, and just read through those things with camera in hand, play with it, and then you'll give yourself the best opportunity to get those shots. Kate asked on Instagram, what are the ideal settings to have your camera on when shooting star trails or star shots? This might be a dumb question, but what exactly is a teleconverter and how do I get one and use it? This isn't really camera related, but where in your opinion is the best place in Africa to view wildlife? Okay, Kate, um, I've done star shots a couple of times now, and it's also on the blog. And again, it comes back to the previous question on recipe driven photography. What are my go to settings? The go to settings I can give you now, and it's in the blog for stars, is simply a starting point. You still have to understand if it's too dark, what can I do to make it lighter or brighter? If it's too light, what can I do? So you have to understand the basics behind it. If for stars, and I'll put this in the links down in Facebook and YouTube as well, go and read the blog, how to photograph stars on the Wild Eye blog. Um, I normally recommend people to start on auto mode. Your lens has to be on, on manual, uh, sorry, auto mode. God damn it, Jerry. Sorry, I do apologize. I never say auto on these videos. Anyway, um, you're gonna go into full manual mode. Your, your lens has to be on, on manual focus and you have to focus on infinity. Then you dial in 20 seconds, uh, ISO 2500, and the smallest F number, so F2.8, F3.5, the largest aperture, that you can on your camera. Take a shot, it's not a go-to setting, it's a starting point. Take a shot, look at it, and then say, if it's too dark, I must make it lighter, so longer shutter speed, and so on and so forth. Go and check the link in the blog, and then send me pictures when you get it. Um, that, that for me would be the best place for me to go to on that one. Uh, what was your other one? Dumb, dumb, there is no dumb questions. Just again, I've been told this and it definitely works because if you have the question, other people will as well. Um, teleconverter, cool. So teleconverter, go and check out Lucas's question two or three ago. What it is, Kate, is you'll take, if you have your camera body and you've got the lens that clicks in. I've got a lens here, um, let's use this. So for example, I've got the lens, my camera, Normally the lens will go onto the camera, yeah? And if this is, for example, a 200 mm lens, it will multiply that focal distance, so focal length. So for example, the converter will go onto the lens and then connect into the camera. So it's a connector, yeah? In between the, uh, the, the, the lens and the camera. You get 1.4, you get two times. So on a two times converter, it will multiply by two a 200 mm lens or a 400 mm lens. So you're shooting 200, you add a two times converter, you're ending with a 400 millimeter. If you're shooting a 1.4 converter on a 200, it'll become times 1.4, which gives you what's that, a 320, yeah, lens. The only downside of that is because of the extra distance from the front of the lens to the sensor, your maximum aperture drops. You can't go F2.8 anymore, you might only go F4, whatever the case is. So it is a handy tool and something I would only use on prime or 2.8 lenses. Like if you have an 80 to 400 or 100 to 400, wouldn't even bother. It just drops your, your aperture so much, it doesn't really become viable. So teleconverter and then reference Lucas's question to find out more. I think there was one more here. Uh, best place in Africa to view wildlife. It is one that's come up often and I might include this in episode 50 as well. Um, you see, it depends what kind of images you want. If you want elephants on their back legs reaching up to trees, you're going to go to Mana Pools. If you want to see leopards, I would say go to the Sabi Sands. If you want to see wild dogs, I would say go to, for example, Tualu or Madikwe. If you want to see the Great Migration, you can go to Kenya or Tanzania, depending on what kind of migration you want to see. You want to see river crossings, you go to Kenya. You want to see um, cats interacting with the herds, Tanzania is great. 
you want to see tree climbing lines, you go answer on answer forth. So depending on what you want to see and what kind of images you're going to get, that will determine the answer to your question. That said, and I've, I'm dealing with a couple of, of, of travel inquiries now where people want to come to Africa for the first time. Where should they go? Now, if you're coming to Africa for the first time, or Kate, as a wildlife photographer, you want to get a good, wide, diverse portfolio of images, you cannot go wrong with East Africa. The difference is there. East Africa's, the topography of the area allows you to get incredible shots, very easy shots sometimes because the backgrounds are nice and open. Whereas in Southern Africa, it's a lot more closed. You're driving through thickets and things and you have to, you'll know, I mean, you go to Madikwe often, I know this, um, you have to kind of wait for him to come out behind the bush or you've got to focus through the bush or whatever. So if I'm going to say to someone on a first trip to Africa, where should you go? I would personally recommend the Mara Triangle because of the diversity, the intensity, the quantity and the quality of game viewing that you get there. You're going to get a very wide range of images and experiences compared to something like you go to Madikwe, for example, you could see four of the five, you get some good general game, leopards, probably not. Maybe, but probably not. You go to the Sabi Sands, you're going to get great leopard viewing, great big five, probably not dogs, and the general game viewing is not as good as up in East Africa. So it's horses for courses. What images do you want to create will depend on where you go. But if it's your first time, you cannot go wrong with East Africa. It's phenomenal. Really, really phenomenal. Um, but yeah, it's, I suppose you ask five people, you're going to ask five, you're going to get five different questions. So um, I hope that helps. Uh, Hey, at the end of the day, you can't go wrong. You get into Africa with the camera and wildlife. It's a thing of beauty. Right, episode 49, done. Um, like I said, if you have any new questions, guys, that you don't think I've answered yet, or that's still bugging you that you don't understand, send them through. Let me know, and I'll include them in episode 50, which I will also then, depending on what I get, um, I want to look at some of the questions that have been asked most often. Because, for example, I'm going to digress for a moment. For example, everybody keeps on asking, and again now, this morning or something I saw this, is how do you get into the industry? I think, I think there's a couple of things there, and this is something we might discuss in episode 50, is you know what industry are you talking about? Because people see, they think I'm a wildlife photographer. I'm not a wildlife photographer. I'm a specialist photographic guide. That's what I do. Yes, I photograph wildlife, but my job is not to photograph wildlife. My job is to help my clients photograph wildlife. If you want to get into that industry, absolutely, I can help you. If you want to get into the wildlife photography, I think people get lost in the romance of a lot of this stuff. And, 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 and it's a tough one to say to someone who's never been to Africa, and th this question comes up often, how can I become a guide? Well, have you been to Africa? No. Okay, so are you currently guiding in your country? No. Eh. Okay, so maybe start there. Maybe build a portfolio. You see what I mean? So there's so many layers to all these things. And in episode 50, I'm going to try and dig a bit deeper into those common questions. Unless you guys come up with some real killer questions, we'll include those as well. Right, so it's Tuesday today. This will be up a little bit later on today. Um, I am still active on Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. I'm finding Twitter coming back a little bit for me. I'm getting some nice interaction there. Um, and then obviously Facebook and so on as well. So any questions, hook me up on any of those platforms. Let's chat. Send me your questions for episode 50. And then hopefully I'm going to wrap up episode 50 by the time I go on safari on Saturday morning. Um, also, a lot of you on Snapchat have been asking, um, will I be doing snaps from safari? Absolutely. Hell yes. However, Monopools and South Luangwa, the, the connectivity is a bit dodgy. So maybe not as much, maybe just from the lodges if they have um, connectivity. But from the 18th of July, I'm back in Kenya where I've got a SIM card and full 3G. So there we will be doing a lot of safari snapping with you guys as well. All right, that's it. I'm going to get this thing processed and online, get back to some work, and then I will chat to you guys online wherever I might find you. My name is Jerry. I'm from Wild Eye. I'll see you guys next time.